Good afternoon, everybody. Have you all had lunch? Yes? So this is the toughest moment after you have lunch. A lot of blood's coming into your stomach, and that's when you feel very sleepy. But uh, it's also uh, going to be a good challenge for me to make you entertain. So first of all, uh, I would like to uh, thank Deal Street Asia uh, and Nikkei for inviting me. And uh, I would like to uh, congratulate the Private Equity and Venture Capital Summit, uh, which is now in, some of you are still wearing masks, uh, some no longer wearing masks. I'm half, halfway because I'm still carrying just in case uh, there are the need to, to have the mask on. But I remember, um, this is feel like deja vu for me. Um, maybe uh, the last time I do this type of conference was five, seven years ago before I joined uh, public service. But what inspired me about the private equity industry, and by the way, I actually stumbled uh, upon private equity when I was fired from my job in 1997 and came back to Indonesia. There is not a, a private equity industry as we know and no uh, private equity uh, Indonesians uh, entrepreneur. Uh, we learn about uh, private equity is actually through the restructuring of the 1997-98 financial crisis, whereby I said I stumbled uh, upon private equity because the type of deals that was actually being done 25 years ago uh, was basically involving structured, very complex, and unwinding of, uh, I guess, the pre-reform uh, financial structures whereby how many percent equity? Anybody would guess during the pre-reform? Typical is 70, now, nowadays a 70% debt and maybe 20, 25% equity, five to 10% mezzanine, but pre-reform days, we call it the new order era, a project or a company that is being taken over, guess what would be the equity compositions on the, fin on the capital structure? Anybody want to guess? 10%? Any other guess? In the back? 5%. One final one, one final guess? Nobody? Nobody dare enough? Try minus 20%. So in the past, a project, well actually, when they started the project, uh, people even make money before the first groundbreaking uh, because uh, they typically would max out the loan the, the loan was supposed to be like 100, but they jack up the loan size to 150 and actually pocket even before construction's project or an acquisitions is being started. So that's why during the 97-95, it's very difficult to uh, structure uh, a, a restructuring or a bailout or an acquisitions because almost zero equity left. So we need to really find companies that have been managed well uh, with some issues in relations to financial crisis, but not are the types of toxic capital structures like before. And, but those were the days when the best deals were made. Those were the days whereby the, not the 3x, the 4x that you 
typically would, would encounter now, but the gargantuan return post-crisis. So the crisis taught all of us back then that it is the best way to invest if you are able to look into some of the very interesting, exciting situations. And COVID actually brought us to the similar uh, situations. But right now, I think uh, it's the other way around. A uh, company's uh, balance sheet is uh, quite strong, except the tourism and some of the creative economy sectors. But from the investment point of view, the lesson learned is basically that deals that return above market, sort of like average return, would happen every time there is a, a cycle such as this one. So for all in the room where some already invested, some looking at uh, additional investments, I would like to welcome to invest uh, in Indonesia. Um, I cannot say I guarantee because I'm now a government official, but from my experience, uh, if you invest in particular sectors that have been strong in Indonesia uh, on a private equity approach, be it technology, healthcare, or anything that has to do with sustainability, uh, green economies, uh, new and renewable energies, you would make a good IRR and typically a, a very, uh, I would say, happy exit uh, of your investments with the hope of reinvesting some of those profits into uh, other investments in Indonesia. So maybe I, I think that's, that's where I uh, left and some are very familiar uh, faces here in the crowd, uh, but some also are new to private equity space. Um, my name is Sandy Uno. I, uh, started my, jo my current job now at the Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy uh, in December uh, 2020, just at the height of the COVID. And it was a very tough time. Uh, and I guess uh, I would like to report uh, some of the early investments that I made, although not in the past, I invested, uh, I deploy capital on a private equity basis, but now I deploy policies and programs for government. The tourism industry and the creative economy sectors uh, said to be the backbone of the Indonesian economy. And uh, I would like to introduce to you the five super priority destinations that we have and represented here. Uh, let me take uh, a poll uh, here. How many of you, please raise your hand if you have been to Bali? Wow, almost 100%. Okay, these are the five super priority destinations that I'm promoting also to Pa Andi and many of our friends at Deal Street Asia and Nikkei. How many of you have been to Danau Toba. Wow, I'm surprised, 20%. How many of you have been to Borobudur? This is amazing, 65%. How many of you have been to Mandalika in Lombok? Wow, less than 20%. This one should get a good reading. How many of you have been to Labuan Bajo? Wow, not that many. It's very beautiful. You guys should, should visit Labuan Bajo, 25%. Now, the final one. How many knows about Likupang? One, two. Okay, the one from the back. Tell me which 
Kabupaten, which region is Likupang from? North Sulawesi is the province, yes, but the Kabupaten. Somebody said correctly, North Minahasa. Please give a big hand to this gentleman. Because he is part of the only 10% of Indonesia that knows Likupang, where is Likupang, and whether it's a, a super priority destinations. So these are the five super priority destinations we have invested, I think, close to five billion US dollar in the last uh, four years, building infrastructures, building um, connectivity uh, in these five super priority destinations to help us promote beyond Bali, because 50% plus of Indonesia's tourism uh, basically concentrated in Bali. How did we do in 2022? I'm a perennial optimist, but I was even surprised how well we did in 2022. The number of foreign tourist arrival in 2022 up to November have reached 4.6 million. The most optimistic number was 3.6 million for the whole year. But thanks to all your support, MICE is coming back, people are staying in destinations longer, we're able to register 4.6 million. Yes, it's still far from the pre-pandemic number of around 16 million, but this is uh, considering that we only start reopening in April, this is something that is truly remarkable. Foreign tourist revenues or tourism revenue, tourism foreign exchange, the most optimistic target was 1.7 billion US dollar. Last year, we almost hit up to November 4.3 billion US dollar. This is, again, almost three times. Either we're very poor in planning or forecasting or we are uh, too pessimistic or we're just simply have been very lucky to be able to hit this number. The creative economy exports have almost reached 25 billion US dollars. Before pandemic, we never come close to 20 billion dollars. So this is a very strong performance with the value added nearly 1300 trillion rupiah. So with this number, we are very, very optimistic how 2023 will look like. We believe 2023 will be able to hit the most optimistic number of foreign tourist arrival at 7.4 million with tourism revenue close to 6 billion US dollars, creative economy export up to 26.5 billion US dollars, and the value adding close to 1,300 trillions, making up that we're number three in the world now in terms of contributions, percentage-wise, of creative economy into the GDP. The GDP, anybody could guess how many percent uh, of the GDP contributions that the creative economy sectors have contributed the last three years? Seven is almost correct. It's 7.4%, making us number three after U.S., which is far ahead with Hollywood, country music. Second is Korea with K-pop, which you all very like, and Korean dramas. But Indonesia is now number three in the world because of the rise of the culinary, fashions, in particular fashions that are being exported, but our musics and films also uh, have done very well post the reopening. Uh, for the very first time after um, a very long time, I think maybe more than 25 years, that more Indonesians watch Indonesian movies than watch uh, non-Indonesian movies. And this is thanks to streaming, whereby we have the uh, Ngeri Ngeri Sedap uh, film, we have the 
uh, recently Big Four and just uh, launched, which is Stealing Radan Saleh. It's very, very um, uh, strong in performance in terms of viewership. So these are the 2023 numbers. Um, by the way, our tourism uh, World Economic Forum have uh, uh, elevated Indonesia's positions on the index of tourism development, 12 uh, levels. It used to rank below some of our ASEAN counterparts, but this year we're ranked uh, just under top 30 in the world, and this is putting us in the ASEAN level ahead of Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, and the Philippines. We're only second to Singapore in terms of tourism development. Why World Economic Forum uh, grant us that jump is basically that our recovery the last 18 months have focused on quality and sustainability. Also focus on nature and culture, which is we're very strong at, and also we're focusing on inclusivity, including SMEs involvement in terms of the recovery. Indonesia also uh, have been recognized as the top oops, destinations uh, in the venture capital and private equity uh, in Asia. I think you guys are all know the number. It's going to continue to be a vibrant uh, economy uh, with the large di digital economy market size reaching around 27 billion uh, in 2025 uh, could reach uh, up a potential up to 100 billion. So this is a destination for venture capital and private equity, so you're in a good spot. But now, how do you make money? I guess from my experience in terms of building track record, you need to look at three things while you're investing here. First is the market is so huge and opportunities are a lot of opportunity, but you need to look at a good management team that could execute. So executions is number one. I think business models are a lot, but the executions team is very important. And it is more important that the team that has been working together for a long time and with good track record of integrity. Secondly, in order for you to be able to get good investments here in various sectors, in particular tourism and creative economy, you need the drive, the innovations. And that's why I like the entrepreneurship of the sectors here. You see, well, there are old money. There have, old money would not, sometimes would not really need your uh, money because they have their own money. Uh, second generations or third generations conglomerates, but they sometimes they invite you to uh, to co-invest. And I think uh, a good friend of mine from SkyStar here from Saratoga Groups, they would like to co-invest with you guys so that you could also share knowledge, uh, innovations, adaptations, and collaborations. But the second point that I think is very very needed is on this. Three things, innovations, adaptations, and collaborations. That gives drive, passions to the management team. And then the third element that is going to be very important, I would call it 3G. First G, we call it gercep. You need to be fast. If you think too much, if you, your due diligence is too long, some of the opportunities are not going to be here. Secondly, you need to geber. In Indonesia, you, ca you call it gerak bersama. You need to invite. Sometimes you want to go solo, but it's going to be a much longer journey if you go together. So don't take the whole portion by yourself. Prepare some chunks to include friends and good uh, local investors who are here, who knows the market very well. 
So, gerak bersama. And for some of you, maybe monitoring the investment from Hong Kong or from Singapore, to have somebody on the ground would be very key. And the, five, the, fifth, uh, the last one is gaspol. Gaspol is that everything is going to go digital. So you need to garap semua potensi, in particular the online opportunity. A lot of businesses are transforming, and this is something that the tourism and creative economy sectors are very excited, because in 2024, we look at creating 4.4 million new jobs, and we will create uh, a much more robust uh, economy, which include SMEs, more women in the workforce. We are the, one of the very few ministries that have more than 60% of women in the leadership positions. Well, the minister is a man, but at home, women also control, control me, <laughs> my wife, typically. But anyway, women decide where to go for vacation, correct? When you go on vacation, who decides uh, where to go? Is it the husband or the wife? Mostly the wife. And if it's buying creative economy products, also for fashion, for culinary experience, is, is normally the wife. So we are bringing more women into the, um, the sector, and very importantly, last but not least, sustainability. The, if you are traveling from New York to Bali, we just calculated with our carbon footprint calculator that you need to plant 64 mangrove trees. So we are having collaborations with Jejak.in, from uh, the Gojek ecosystem, Gojek Tokopedia ecosystem, together with uh, some other uh, collaborations with Traveloka also to compensate, to offset your carbon footprint. So this type of new tourism uh, product is being heavily marketed and have enjoyed good uh, outcome, uh, a lot of interest, especially from the millennials, and uh, is also going to reshape the tourism industry to go more eco-tourism, personalized, localized, albeit smaller in size. I'll stop here, and maybe if you have questions, I'll invite uh, uh, Eddie, uh, maybe, or somebody else to moderate. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Happy investing, and good luck. Thank you so much, Minister. For that keynote, and of course, I'd like to invite Minister to take a seat to join us for our fireside chat right now. Coming up, we have a very interesting fireside chat titled Leveraging the Soft Power of Tourism and Creative Economy to Generate Alpha. And to help us moderate this, let us welcome on stage the Chief Executive Officer, BNI Ventures, Eddie Danu Saputro, please. Give him a round of applause. And there he is. Without further ado, Eddie, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I have the pleasure to moderate a session of fireside, fireside chat with uh, Pak Sandi, uh, Mr. Minister. Yeah. Um, I'll be asking several questions. We'll have a dialogue. But we have some time at the end uh, for questions from the audience. And uh, so raise your hand, or I think the uh, the organizers can, can facilitate on how you can submit your questions. I'll be giving some uh, uh, gifts for those who ask questions from, from myself. Uh, I'm, for example, the first one who, who asks a question for Prime Minister, I'll give a, a trip to Bali uh, using a wooden kayak uh, <laughs> from, from wherever you are. Uh, uh, and so you can get to see the, the, the coastline, you know. Okay, it'll take you maybe two weeks to get there uh, or more, but uh, it'll be a fun, interesting uh, trip. So again, thank you for the keynote, uh, Pak Sandi. Uh, I have several questions. Actually, I had a lot of questions, but Deal Street Asia said, no, Pak you cannot ask this one, no, cannot, this one cannot, cannot, choret, 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 yeah. So uh, it's a mix of uh, questions as a minister, and hopefully I can ask some questions also, Pak Sandi, as an investor, yeah. 
Karena okay. I hope that side of you is still in there somewhere, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as long as you don't ask questions about politics, I'm fine. Okay. Okay. Maybe some stock tips, maybe. Uh, but you are offering uh, gifts to the questions. How about the one who answers? Any gift from BNI? Of course, of course, we can we can really. <laughs> uh, okay, first question. Um, I guess pa, uh, Sandy was humble. Uh, his, his official title is the Minister of uh, uh, Tourism and Creative Economy. Okay, what not everybody knows that within the creative uh, ministry aspect, there's correct me if I'm wrong, pa, 17 subsectors. Okay, Sub there there are 13 subsectors in. Uh, tourism, which is hotel, restaurant, cafe, and the likes, uh, including online travel agent. But in the creative economy sectors, there are 17 subsectors from the massive culinary, fashion, uh, to design, uh, architecture, uh, also handicrafts. We also have music, film, applications. It's huge uh, uh, digital economy is under us. Um, Television, radio, basically the media, and uh, these 17 subsectors actually employ close to 24 million people. Wow. Uh, so those are a lot of sectors. Uh, my question is, how do you integrate all of them? They're all. How do you avoid them uh, going their own path without collaborating, without integrating? And some are, are very, uh, for lack of a better term, from, some are very old school, some are very traditional, like handicraft, uh, uh, batik manufacturing, and some are very digital, like gaming. Uh, is, is, and some maybe overlap, some cannot overlap or do not overlap, and how do you integrate all of that? For the one who's doing very well, we try to get out of their way. And government should stay away, over-regulating, and try to introduce uh, rules or policies that actually make their business tough. Um, but for some of those who need help, we need to empower them by giving them training. Uh, we provide them mentorship. We provide them uh, marketing help. Also, we provide them access to capital. So these 17 subsectors are completely the new economy. Uh, I, because I come from private sectors, I think the government in the past think that they, they have the power, but I told them that from our budget that is very limited, we should focus on be in the positions how we could help these industries to grow, to scale up. And some of them need training, so we need to work with uh, private providers to provide upskilling, reskilling, and new skilling because there are new skills being made available. I spend more time in deregulating some of these sectors, uh, and in in the case that they need regulations, I introduce sandbox approach. Um, this sandbox is uh, provided and let them uh, use the sandbox approach. And once it's sort of like uh, find its form and shape, then we'll try to see where the government could play a role to, to assist, to help, but not to stand in the way or make uh, more complicated. In terms of permitting and licensing, everything is now moved to uh, Ministry of Investments. I hope you are getting your license uh, solved, but I'm sure not. So we, I got a lot of emails asking us to facilitate. So we become your concierge. People have problems with visa. You know, people have problem with. Uh, their stay per work permits, and so on and so forth. So anything that has to do with the uh, sectors, we're, we're there to facilitate. OK, very good. So this is what we want to hear as, as business people, as investors, uh, I might say. Um, we, we, we prefer, I guess, governments and regulators that are light touch, so to speak, not heavy-handed. 
and not really rule-based, but I guess principle-based. As long as we're moving towards the right direction, you know, we, we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, be heavy-handed in terms of, of our oversight. Uh, so I appreciate this, uh, uh, Pasandi. Uh, further to that question, um, one of the sectors, I guess I'm maybe talking to a different demographic here, but the younger demographic, my, 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 uh, the next generation, um, gaming is a big industry. Um, but honestly speaking, if, you know, our kids, our nephews, our nieces, uh, which games do they play? Most of them are not Indonesian games. These are, uh, I, I'm sorry to name names, but you know, whether it's Fortnite or uh, Mobile Legend or the others, most of them are not uh, Indonesian produced games. Um, so I, I think, and I want to ask uh, Sandy is, is, what are we doing or what is the government doing to kind of promote a uh, homegrown gaming industry? On the film sector, Pa Andy is here, uh, we, we've already seen a good sign of a, of a local film industry, but we need more on, on the gaming side so that not all of the next generation generation only plays uh, foreign, foreign uh, multimedia games. Right, it's a two and a half billion dollar industry. Games, uh, I was shocked at the number of players that we just uh, being updated. It's now close to 150 million Indonesians play game in some sort of games. It could be chess or it could be PUBG Mobile or Mobile Legend. In the last seven days, there are two major gaming event here. First is the PUBG Mobile uh, Global Championship in GI Expo that stream close to three and a half million concurrently. Uh, and I just opened the M4, this Mobile Legend um, Championship in Sanayan that runs for more than eight days. That attracts, I think, concurrent few close to uh, four or five million, and we have two Indonesian team qualified. Um, I also see that some of this, on the, if you look at the economics of the gaming industry, 99% actually flew out of the door of the Indonesian's uh, economy because of uh, the uh, games, but there's also uh, jobs that is being created here, like streamer, caster, team owner, and the player who make a lot of money, but some of the game, gaming revenues, uh, I think majority will go. So my task, uh, and this, the, the president uh, felt that the gaming industry, because it's close to the Gen Z and Gen Millennial uh, uh, demography, uh, we need to do something. So last year, I got an instructions to start a review, what type of uh, presidential uh, decree legislations can help local game developer to uh, achieve, because it's very high risk, this game developer, um, and you guys would only invest in some of the, uh, probably uh, the proven ones, uh, the Lokapalas, uh, uh, Satria Dewa, and uh, most recent uh, uh, Battle of Guardians. But this needs to be fixed by way of providing an ecosystem that governments could also provide assistance for local game developers to uh, be able to reach uh, a stage where the venture capital would come in and invest. So we are focusing on that. The legislation is uh, being uh, uh, right now formulated. The second um, initiative is uh, an entity that focus like, uh, uh, B, we call it BLU, Badan Layanan Usaha, which is like a government entity that provides uh, so-called uh, equity or more like a, a soft loan on a uh, revolving basis to provide 
um, to the ecosystem, to the gaming ecosystem, uh, in order to help getting more allocations or percentage of this fastly growing industries, and Indonesia would, would benefit by way of tax revenues or creating good quality jobs. So I'm part of the esports industries, uh, and last year we won the World Cup of esports in Bali. Uh, we won, the, I think, Mobile Legend or uh, PUBG. So uh, this is also something that uh, bring uh, a lot of attention because it comes from the sports uh, arena as well. And every single weekend we will have. Uh, gaming events, and this is also good for an event select recovery. So these are what we are doing with the government. I'm sure it's going to be, uh, it's going to need a lot of collaborative efforts with with the industry. Okay. Excellent. Um, Pasandi, you play also esports? I I don't play that well, so I enjoy more watching. Then playing, I play simple uh, games from the old years. That is still my favorite, like the the Tetris and uh, anybody still play Tetris? It shows the age. Oh, still in the back. Thank you. We could play Tetris together. Okay. Actually, actually, I challenge pa, I'll challenge Pa Sandy uh, as a fellow basketball enthusiast. We play NBA 2K or maybe FIFA. FIFA. NBA 2K. Yes, I can play a little bit, but I play better uh, uh, on on one on one. So okay. yes, Pak Edi, okay. we could we could do one on one. Yeah, challenge accepted. Uh, okay, so Pak Sandi in his keynote speech uh, mentioned about the uh, top five uh, tourist uh, destinations: uh, Baju, uh, Bali, uh, Lombok, uh, Likupang, yeah, dari terakhir ya. I think you already invested there, yeah. That's why you know the answer, yeah. You're for, for, uh, forward looking, yeah. Okay. Uh, now that's on the tourism side. Now on the creative economy side, does Indonesia need a destination for talent, like a Silicon Valley or Bangalore type of uh, location? Uh, some are already homegrown, or have already uh, uh, propped up, uh, like Jogja, uh, Malang, you know, several places, right? But do we need a, a place where you know uh, local talent, developer talent, coding talent, and startups and investors can congregate? Uh, it's going to evolve naturally. Uh, the government in the past tried to outsmart the market and failed many times. Um, but this industry will find uh, um, innovative uh, government in terms of providing solutions so that they could, uh, they could set up shop. Uh, I think Changu has been number one. Uh, nationally and I think globally number two in terms of bringing all these digital talents. Um, I think Jogja uh, uh, has been very strong, Bandung and Malang. We're building these uh, special economic zones. I uh, did not mention in my presentations, but we have eight special economic zones on tourism and creative economy uh, sectors providing tax holidays, incentives, uh, facilitations for permits. The special economic zones in, uh, in near Malang is basically between Malang and Surabaya, uh, offering uh, the uh, space for uh, digital entrepreneurs who wants to start uh, the business uh, with assistance from the government for financing. And in fact, BNI is actually our partner there. It's called Kek Singosari. KEX stands for Kawasan Ekonomi Khusus. Uh, so far, we, uh, we've been able to attract some of the animations uh, developer, uh, making content for not only uh, private sectors, but also government. So uh, this has been a, a good strategy so far, but the market will, uh, will sort of like tell us uh, what they would need in terms of policies and what they want us to remove in terms of regulations. So you have to trust the market. It has to be organic, uh, and, and, and I guess uh, it'll flow uh, naturally. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, moving back to the uh, tourism uh, uh, part of your uh, portfolio, um, you're targeting, Indonesia targeting what, 7.4 million foreign uh, tourists coming into Indonesia this year, 7.4 million uh, foreign tourists for this year. Uh, how does technology play in this? Um, uh, is your ministry doing efforts, uh, there are any efforts to enable technology or using apps or other parts of uh, technology to help achieve this target of 7.4 million foreign tourists? Technology plays such a huge uh, role in achieving even last year's number because all of our marketing and promotions now are using technologies. We're doing targeted and segmented and sometimes when you watch your Korean dramas, wonderful Indonesia pop up, uh, that's using the, uh, the latest uh, technology in terms of trying to catch from interest to convert to actual travel, from look to buy. So uh, this is something that we have been developing with our uh, partners in terms of how we could get the type of tourist that stays longer. In the past, people come here, 16 million plus, most of them do Rohali. You know what Rohali stands for? Rombongan hanya liat-liat. So they come here, they just look see, look see, um, not, uh, they, they spend three to four days and go back with limited impact to local economy. Now I need to convert them to become rojali, rombongan yang jajan-jajan dan beli-beli produk ekonomi kita. So, so we need to engage them with technology because most of the travelers are the, uh, from the younger demographics and they are guided by, by uh, their applications, by their uh, mobile devices. So that's from interest. Length of stay. In the past, they come here three, four days because they are not being offered. Right now, when they arrive uh, and check in, we work with partners, uh, we're able to offer them uh, Bali and beyond because typically 50% of them come through Bali and when they come to Jakarta, we will be able to offer them so that their length of stay now is actually grow from just three to four days now nearing 10 days. This is good impact. So even with the much lower number of tourists, the quality of our tourists were able, and were able to be increased by three times. And that's why you see the tourism revenue. Because I come from your part of business from investments. I look at the dollars. If I get 16 million tourists, but the dollars amount, the tourism revenue is not strong, then I'm not going to be able to uh, show a good KPI. Because every single tourist will have a, their impact to the environment. So if their impact to the environment is not compensated by their impact to the local economies, then it's, it's going to be, a, uh, I would say, a, a lower quality type of recovery. So this is something that, that we're doing. Technology plays a huge role uh, in destination management, in sustainable tourism practices. Technology is everywhere. It's 360. Uh, even, I would say, uh, Right now, because the average age of the, minist uh, the ministry workforce is also very young, that we are moving into a lot of uh, technology breakthrough. For instance, uh, this is something that I'm going to ask you. This technology helped us, and this is by way of help from our data. Please tell me what would be the unfulfilled demand by tourists in a particular destination, let's say in East or in Yogyakarta. Unfulfilled demand in terms of 
tourist attractions. Any guess? We thought that they would be looking for nature. We thought that they would be looking to see culture or the temple. But technology and data shows us that they actually want water park. So we're guiding the industry, invest in water park, because this is unfulfilled demand. On the creative economy, economy side, culinary, when you're in Yogyakarta, what do you think would be the unfulfilled demand? What type of food? Any guess? Technology and data actually shows that tourists want sushi. <laughs> they want sushi, especially salmon mentai. Okay, drinks. What do you think people who come to Yogyakarta wants but still not enough supply? That means an unfulfilled demand. Guess? So this data was guiding us all the way and we've been telling the industry this is what you need to invest, this is what you need to look at. So majority of the people who visit Yogyakarta actually wants boba drinks. Not chendol, not dawet, but boba. So these are the type of uh, technology being applied right away and we're guiding the industry. We're, we're making sure that they, uh, they got this. And I said, data is data. data uh, will not be able to deceive you, but it's for you to take opportunities. Thank you, Pa Sandy. Uh, actually, time is up, but uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, uh, ask some more questions from the audience. I'm going to combine several of the questions quickly, uh, Pa Sandy. Uh, one, uh, a question from the audience, what is the government doing in terms of uh, uh, helping uh, investment uh, into this uh, tourism and creative economy sector? Uh, for example, uh, access to loans, uh, tax breaks, uh, what is available for, for the players currently? Uh, basically, it's the special economic zones, the eight CACs, and we're adding one more uh, special economic zone in Bali. So these are the areas where you can get your tax breaks, you could get uh, uh, a lot of facilitations from the government, uh, you could you have the land. Some of the issues in relations to tourism and creative economy have uh, uh, basically dealt with the land availability. This is going to be provided by the government. And through this eight special economic zones, we're also able to provide tax holidays. Excellent. Uh, Thank you, uh, Pa Sandy. Uh, on behalf of everybody in the audience, uh, thank you for the time, not only the keynote speech, but uh, uh, the, the discussion. We learned a lot today, and hopefully uh, all the investors here, private equity, venture capital firms, you know, we see uh, this uh, sector specifically as a very promising sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good luck investing in Indonesia. Thank you so much once again to our Minister of Tourism and Creative Economy for Indonesia, Sandiaga Salahuddin Uno, for joining us this lovely afternoon. And of course, thank you as well to our Chief Executive Officer for BNI Ventures, Eddie Danu Saputro, for moderating that session.